Thank you, Dom. Love you. Love my ICU Talks family. I love that you guys like for me to come here and talk about the times I was crazy. Um, so I want to tell you that I have not told this story, and it's been really terrible putting this together, and I have not enjoyed it. And um, I've had to, to face a lot of shame and a lot of current demons, and, well, it's just been gross. So here goes. Um, I was not a little girl dreaming of marriage and family. I was a success girl. I was good at school. I got good grades. I was valedictorian. I was headed out to college to get a good degree, a good job, a lot of money, travel the world, invent things, just some of that stuff. And, um, and so in keeping with that, I was married at 21 and I took whatever job would keep us together. So that was God, that was his will, and that's how life works. Um, we did not, we, we did not know a lot about kids. And so for the next six years, we just did whatever we wanted to, and it was, it was fantastic. Um, but then we wanted to, to not do that anymore, I guess. And so we embraced this family thing where I was going to have this baby. And so I was a, a success girl and I was going to be great at it. And I read all the books, which my mom would eventually remind me the baby had not read. Um, <laughs> And she was so right. Um, so one of the things I had to do is I had to go off my medication. And I had been treated for depression and anxiety in high school, um, suicidal tendencies. And then later in life, it was obsessive compulsive disorder. And so that treatment seemed to be keeping everything in line. And, um, you know, I went off the medicine and I guess pregnancy hormones just worked really well. So I felt great and we're doing this thing. And my, my psychiatrist was like, you know, you're, you're probably at risk for postpartum depression, postpartum psychosis. And I, I gave a nod to his professional opinion and I did not receive that because I was positive pregnant lady who was doing all the things. So if you know anything about kids, or even if you've just sat across from them at a restaurant, you know that like things are gonna happen and you didn't expect it. So um, unexpected things, things I didn't know would happen and I have a list here. Um, I did not know that Nathan would be a week early. I didn't know he would be an eight pound tall baby and a short woman and that he would take the very end of my tailbone with me when he vacated. I did not know that I would not be able to sit down for six months to a year. I did not know that the day after he was born and I fell in love with him, some nurses would come in and take him away. And so he went to the NICU for antibiotics and I spent the next week in the back seat of my mom's car as soon as I could get myself up. I would lie down because I couldn't sit and I would go over there and I would try to feed the kid before the NICU nurses got to them because their job is to make everybody twice their size. So avoid them. Um, so I would get in there. I did not know that um, I did not know that I would work so hard to take care of something that was like a whole exit away. And I'm I'm thankful, right? It was just one exit away. Um, and I had a healthy baby. He actually looked like he had eaten a couple of the other babies. Um, he he was big and squishy and not in a cage. And so the other nurses would hold him while they did computer work um, because most of those babies were like three or four pounds. I did not know that um, this whole, so if you're gonna be a good mom and you read the books and you have to breastfeed your baby, I'm sorry if that makes you uncomfortable, um, but I didn't know how that was gonna look as I was gonna sit on a toilet assist chair that would support my tailbone problem behind a screen, holding my baby while little three pound Jimmy's mom and dad and grandpa were on the other side of it, watching him in this cage and that, um, it wouldn't go well. And so every now and then, um, a NICU nurse, she'd ask first, but she'd actually come over and kind of milk me. Um, so we were bonding, like all 11 of us, we were bonding. It was really great. Um, it went just, just the way I had planned. Um, I did not know that one Thursday night, I would leave there elated that the next day I would have my baby at home and that I would wake up the next morning and I would not want him and I would not want to be alive, and that every day for months after that would be the most miserable, difficult hopelessness that I had ever experienced. I looked up postpartum depression, postpartum psychosis, um, things you might expect, irritability, insomnia, shame, mood swings, 
difficulty communicating strange beliefs and delusions. Um, hallucinations, that's where the, the psychosis kind of comes in. And I didn't have a diagnosis. Um, this ends in about a 5% suicide rate and about a 4% infanticide rate, if that's even how you say that. Um, so I didn't know a lot of things. I did not know that um, he would cry for eight months, that he would have all these stomach problems, probably because he started his life out with seven days of anti antibiotics. Um, I did not know that the nurses and the pediatrician would think he had a food allergy. Um, and so I would cut back food and I would cut back food and I would try to feed this kid. And I eventually got to the place where I was ashamed to eat. Um, I would go to eat and then I would feel like it would hurt the baby and I wouldn't eat. Um, and I lost all my pregnancy weight and an extra 15 pounds and I'm, I'm at 100 pounds and I'm trying to keep another person alive because I am ashamed if I eat. Um, I did not know that when he cried during the day that I would audibly hear the word failure. I wouldn't feel like I was a failure because he cried. I would hear it and I would hear the command to make it stop by whatever means necessary. I did not know that at night when his cries woke me up that I would wake up like having a panic attack all within two seconds. And this, this painful burning would go through my whole body and I would gasp for air and I would feel a gun pressed to my head. And that every time that happened, I would wish it would go off and I would never have to wake up that way again. I didn't know that I would feed him and I would come back to bed and I would be exhausted and I would not be able to sleep. And I would have full conversations in my head about how I shouldn't set the house on fire while everybody was asleep. I mean, I knew that I shouldn't, but it also seemed like maybe I should, that I should just set fires all around the exits. I didn't know that that was gonna happen. I didn't know that I would be paranoid that I would expect my husband to leave me, that I would think that anybody who tried to help me was actually plotting against me, and they wanted to harm me, and they wanted to harm my child. I didn't know that I would be unable to explain any of this to my psychiatrist, um, therapist, pastors, because I was just paralyzed when I had to talk to somebody about it. Um, three months, and the, the choice was taken away from me. I had no more fight left. I had no more energy. I had no more calories. Um, and basically, Nathan was put on formula, and I was put on some really significant drugs. And we talk here about Jesus and therapy and medication, and all those things are necessary, but if you've ever been put on medication and what you really needed was to talk to somebody, you know that you settle down and you level out and you don't do crazy things, and then you just feel more hopeless because you're not where you need to be. And that's where I was, and I, I will say that I was a terrible mental health advocate for myself. I did not, um, I did not, ever get the help that I needed. In fact, when I started working on this talk, even a few years ago, I thought, can you, can you go in and get like a postpartum counselor when your baby is 12? Like, can you do that? Um, and, and I wanted to, and I just always felt really dumb about it. So I stand here and I say, I have not done the right things. That's why this talk was really ugly to put together. Um, there's a song I love that says, shame is a prison, it's cruel as the grave. Shame is a robber and he's come to take my name. There's a few things that I've learned um, through this process. Um, one, shame didn't just come from me. And one of the things that has fueled me through the life of my kids, uh, this was 14 years ago, was a love for them and a desire to protect them. And when I came to the point where I realized shame came from my, it came for my family, 
It came from my, my children. It came to attack who I was as a mother. Um, that was something that I was able to use. I was able to use positive energy to speak out against it, to rebuke it, to, to send it back where it came from. Uh, a lot of my talks have been on spiritual warfare. Uh, and that, that's my experience. I engaged the spiritual realm in ways that weren't of God. And I got myself into trouble. And I didn't know what I was doing. And I had to be delivered. And I will forever be a Jesus girl because of that. Because I know the power in his name. But as much as I know that we are spiritual people in a spiritual environment. And that there's all of this going on around us that we do not see. I know that we are tethered to these chemical bodies. And just like, just like taking in the wrong kind of food, just like taking in an allergen, there's going to be a reaction. I don't know if you've ever listened to Dr. Caroline Leaf, but she's amazing and that she is a brain scientist and she studies how thoughts are formed. And so one of the things that I want to make sure I never do from the stage is indicate that um, everything could come from spiritual warfare because we have so many things coming at us in this world, so many um, thoughts, so, many, so much bad news, so much pain, so much um, that you take from the people around you, that you take from the news, that you take from social media. And, and, it, and it influences and it causes a chemical reaction and that's just something we can't get away from. It's just a, it's a weakness of being on this earth. Um, And so if you had said to me during the, the crazy time as I sat on the floor with my baby crying and I yelled at the voices, the sounds that weren't there and the commands and I told them, no, I'm the, I'm the crazy one. I can't hurt this kid. I, I, this is my problem. I'm the failure. I'm the one who's not doing right. Take, take me. What, what do I need to do? I thought about the women who try for years to have babies and and they can't, and they would have been great moms. They wouldn't have had these thoughts. I think about, you know, the single woman who just, you know, has so much love to give and, and would love to adopt, and maybe that doesn't work out. Um, I think about, you know, the, the lady who has had um, miscarriage after miscarriage, and, and those people, I mean, surely they deserve a baby. And God, why would you... Why, why would you do this? You knew I didn't know what I was doing. You could have just said no. And instead, you brought this child into this mess. And now I've, now I've passed this shame. Now I've passed this craziness on to him. And um, now Nathan is a, is a wonder. He, he's intelligent. He's musical. He's funny. By the time he could stand up and lift his big head, he could also talk and read and sing on key. Um, but I've watched a lot of things come against him. And every time they do, I think, well, it's because he lived with this crazy woman. I mean, what would you expect from that story? What, what could anybody expect out of this poor child who lived with a lady who, who couldn't even care for him, couldn't even feed him? Um, screamed while he was crying and he just had normal needs, you know, and I, I thought it was like the devil talking to me. Um, I remember when he had an ultrasound. I remember the big one, you know, we were supposed to find out if it was a boy or a girl. And that, that's really the only thing that I fixated on. I, I don't know about baby stuff. So I went in there and if I had had any idea what I was going to see, I would have fallen out in a panic attack before I got there. Um, and I got to see every organ, both kidneys were functioning. I got to see the brain developing. I got to see every valve of his heart move. And it was, it was amazing. And, and I almost felt like I had violated the privacy that was between he and God. I mean, this was going on in my body, and you can say, oh, that's amazing, and the, the human body is amazing. I, I was not doing that. I didn't know which way those valves needed to go. And I was so aware at that moment that I was not in charge. 
I was not doing this thing. It, it wasn't my show. And one of the things that has come out of this is I, I was able to get to a place where I realized I am not creating this person. I am not providing for this person. God has given me a gift, and it's not even really mine. This is his child. Um, I wrote sometime this morning, um, just came over me, that sometimes shame comes from thinking that I'm in control and that I'm trying to accomplish something, and then I'm failing. And if I can just start out knowing, um, in many situations, I'm just not in control. It's, it's not my dance. I, I'm not calling the shots. Um, maybe you're ashamed because you can't just quit the addiction. Maybe you're ashamed because you can't just get over the trauma. Um, <laughs> I, I was ashamed because I couldn't just parent a baby. Um, but this was God's child, and, and, and it wasn't, it, that wasn't my calling, and I was ashamed because I made it, I made it way too much about me and what I was going to accomplish. Um, I can tell you that if somebody had come up to me and they had said, well, you should pray more, you should get closer to God, I got up every single morning during that time, and I prayed over him, I read psalms over him, I sang hymns over him, and it, and it brought peace but by mid-morning, I was defeated every single day. And I think that's important to know. Um, I think it's important that, that I share that and that I say that I did those things and it's not that God failed. Oh, I, I felt like he was. I felt like he was failing. I felt like he had left me there. And that may, was he laughing at me? Was he laughing at my failure? But I had taken, I had made it too much about me. Um, yes, there was an illness. Yes, it was probably brought about by postpartum hor hormones. Yes, um, you know, not eating for a couple of months is not great. Not sleeping is, is not great. But also the perfectionism that you talked about, that was the key is that I thought I was running the show and I was going to do a really good job with it. And it didn't turn out the way I wanted. And all I had to do was just show up. Um, and love this, love this baby. Um, it was difficult, and I did everything that I could do with what I had to work with. And the shame just has to end there. Um, I think I think I would just want you to know that shame is a prison. Cruel is a grave, shame is a robber, and he's come to take my name. Love is my redeemer, lifting me up off the ground. And love is the power for my freedom song is found. And if anything in my life has taught me um, my weaknesses, my limitations, and how to trust God and live in his freedom, it has been trying to mother this person that's a whole different person and does whatever he wants and has his own will. Um, and whatever your situation is, I hope that you can find a place for redemption from shame, that you can send Satan running, um, turning what he meant for evil into good in your life, that you can reach out to God and you can um, know that he's there and you can work through it and you can find the help that you need, Jesus, therapy, and medication, and um, and that's my prayer for everybody who hears this message.